I'm Michael Osman. I am the founder of, of Great Scott Gadgets. You might know me from projects like Ubertooth and HackRF. Uh, oh yeah, and which just launched on Kickstarter yesterday. Thank you for those of you guys who are uh, contributing. I really appreciate it. Um, this, uh, I kind of started this project, but uh, mostly my role is getting people together to work on it. So a lot of this is really stuff that these other guys to my right are going to talk about. Uh, Dominic, Sp ah, I messed up. Dominic Spill, uh, wave Dominic. He's uh, lead on the Ubertooth project at this point and has been for a while. Um, he's doing a lot of the host code and uh, getting these demos working and stuff with uh, for Daisho, uh, which he's chuckling about. Um, the uh, he has some interesting other projects going on like uh, uh, tapping PS2 keyboards and playing with uh, USB on Beagle Bones and all kinds of stuff that he'd love to talk to you about if you catch him and buy him a beer. Uh, Mike Kershaw, you know him as Dragorn of the Kismet Project and uh, creator of the Kisby, which is shown on screen there, which is a uh, uh, Zigbee and 802.15.4 sniffer, all kinds of other cool stuff. Um, he's doing a lot of our hardware design on this project. Uh, oh, and we don't have a slide for Jared here. Wave your hand, Jared. This is Jared Boone. Uh, he's not on the, uh, he's not an official speaker for this talk and we didn't put a slide in here for him be because he told us he wasn't coming. And, <laughs> and here he is. So uh, Jared was, uh, he's helped me out a lot with a whole bunch of my projects from early on like the Ubertooth project. Uh, he had a huge part in the HackRF project. Uh, he's a major part of the Die Show project so we dragged him up here. Uh, and he's also been uh, quite instrumental in getting our demos working here today. Uh, so uh, we decided that he was going to sit up here and talk with us. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the project. Uh, then we're going to talk about you know what we're doing, why, how, and what our progress is so far. This really is a, a work in progress, uh, but we have a lot of cool stuff to show already. Um, this is a standard disclaimer you'll see on a lot of projects that are funded by uh, the, diver, the, the blah, 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 cyber thing, you know, DARPA cyber fast track pro, uh, program started by Mudge. Uh, so thanks Mudge and cyber fast track program. Um, we built our first devices, our own boards, uh, our own main board in May. And uh, or uh, and since then, um, but a lot of the stuff that we're doing are demos that are partially our own boards and partially commercial development boards, kind of a mishmash of things, just to get things working. Um, and w so far, the bring up of our main board, we'll talk about it a little later. It's going pretty well, but. Uh, um, it is a work in progress and there are a couple of members of our team who are not with us today. Um, Benjamin Vernu who is uh, also somebody who's contributed a lot to the HackRF project. He's in France at the moment um, where he lives. And uh, Marshall Hecht who is uh, somebody who's had a major role in this project and we'll talk about his role in the project later on. Um, he's not able to be with us today either. Also we hang out in the Dice Show channel on Freenode so if you are interested in this project and you want to chat with us just come drop by IRC anytime. So I had this idea and this was kind of where this project came from originally. I had this idea that I wanted to build something like this, a USB multi-tool. Something like a little microcontroller based board that had multiple high speed USB interfaces. So I could connect it um, for example for USB man in the middle stuff. I wanted to have one port connected to a host and another port connected to a device and be able to emulate a host to the device, be able to emulate a device to the host and do all kinds of stuff, monitoring, injection, modification of the traffic going between the, the two, uh, you know, going over the USB bus. And that led me to some other ideas um, like 
putting a, a, the USB man in the middle device between two USB devices instead of between a host and a device, you might be able to connect two devices back to back through this special thing. Um, and that you could do some interesting stuff like duplicating flash drives without a host, um, maybe connecting uh, a Bluetooth adapter to a keyboard and turning it into a Bluetooth keyboard, all kinds of creative things. You could also potentially connect a host to a host through this device and I don't know, do some kind of networking topologies, um, all kinds of interesting stuff y y that you could accomplish. Um, and I'd want us like a third USB port for monitoring. So I would need something that's like really small with a microcontroller and three high speed USB ports preferably embedded uh, integrated into the microcontroller uh, something like this and it didn't really seem like this was going to happen. There, there, there weren't a lot of options for a, a chip that would do what I wanted um, and as I kind of explored how I might build something like this it got bigger and bigger and more expensive and not really the small thing I wanted. I wanted like something that would fit on my keychain <laughs> and be a bottle opener. Um, didn't seem like that was going to happen. So I'm also interested in making a gigabit ethernet tap. I've had the throwing star LAN tap for a long time that only monitors 10 base T and 100 base T and if you plug it into a gigabit ethernet connection it actually knocks it down to 100, 100 megabit, uh, 100 base TX and um, lets you monitor it that way. But people always ask me, hey Mike when are you going to come out with a gigabit ethernet tap? And it's my, my answer has always been well when it looks interesting to me because there are already gigabit taps on the market. Um, it's relatively straightforward to use a, in a gigabit ethernet switch IC and like one of these chips that's in an ethernet switch and find one that supports port mirroring and just configure it for port mirroring and make basically a special purpose small switch that just is a tap. And there are already products on the market that do that. So that makes it less compelling for me. I like, tr I like trying to do things that other people haven't done before. Um, also the ethernet chips that are out on the market are not really open source friendly. They're, they're not available in small quantities. You generally can't download documentation for them without signing an NDA. So that also kind of tempered my interest in, in, the, um, in that sort of solution. So but I have thought about well what would be other ways that I could do interesting things with gigabit ethernet and the best way that finally kind of presented itself and, and I think mostly it was talking to Dominic some months back that, that kind of led me to this conclusion was, was that w we could just plug in phi ICs. I don't know how many of you guys saw Andrea and Daniela's talk earlier today but they were talking about phi and Mac chips for ethernet. There's the phi layer chip that's a physical layer and then there's the Mac layer chip that's the Mac layer that talks to your host computer typically and they're typically uh, two different functions on two different chips. So instead of having a Mac and a phi we could just get rid of the Mac and just connect the phi chip to another phi chip through some programmable logic like an FPGA, uh, field programmable gate array. And if we do this, if we connect multiple phi chips to an FPGA, it lets us implement our own Mac layer or even kind of do without a Mac layer and just transfer raw kind of phi layer data or it's kind of halfway between phi and Mac layer data um, but it's, it's basically the lowest layer we can get, the GMII interface in this case for gigabit ethernet um, through the FPGA where we can control things and we can duplicate data in the FPGA and tap that data at the physical layer or as close to the physical layer as we can which is a little different than most uh, Mac layer devices like the taps and ethernet switches that are on the market today. So this was kind of exciting because we could do some things potentially phi things that we couldn't do uh, with a Mac layer device. And it would be, it would be so much more flexible for the things that we want to do for security research and development. 
Um, but hey, if we have that kind of an architecture for doing uh, gigabit ethernet, why not use the same architecture to do what I wanted to do all along with USB man in the middle? There's a, a USB PHY chip, the USB 2.0 PHY chips are called ULPIs. Um, so just as an example, we could put a U ULPI connected to an FPGA connected to another ULPI. And we could do the same kind of PHY layer tricks potentially um, with a completely different protocol using the same basic architecture. Um, I just went the wrong direction. So if we were to make it modular, if we have an FPGA based board that has a high speed connection to a host computer for doing monitoring and control and so forth, then um, it would be nice to have a modular front end that has the PHY chips and the connectors for whatever target medium we're interested in, whether that's gigabit ethernet or USB or anything else. And that's how the Daisho project was born. Um, so as you can see, we named it after a pair of pair of swords uh, as, as to sort of represent the uh, the front end and the mainboard um, pairing, um, and because we couldn't come up with a better name. So let's talk about what it what it's actually going to be once we once we build these things. Um, the idea is we can have a physical layer monitor for multiple technologies. As Mike said, there's gigabit ethernet, there's USB, but we also want to look at other things. Um, we're looking at, uh, at other targets, anything high speed, anything that where we can do the data backhaul over, over USB 3. Um, the idea being that once we've built this platform, we can just build new front end modules in the future to target any additional technology that we want to look at. Um, so We've got some targets within scope for the for the project, but they're not necessarily the only front end targets we're going to have. Um, Mike and I, and and I think everyone in the team is is pretty militant about open source, both uh, software and hardware. Uh, almost all of our other projects are are open source, and we kind of we we like to to maintain that as a a design philosophy. Uh, everything we we develop is developed on GitHub or SourceForge or something like that. Everything you see today is already available and has been uploaded to our Git repositories. So you can go and download the hardware designs and the software and, and play around with it at the moment. Uh, not that it all works, so probably best to wait. Uh, affordables, affordables an, uh, an interesting term. Um, obviously, as Mike said, getting a, a, a gigabit Ethernet switch and um, modifying it to, to monitor a port, to mirror a port, is, is fairly cheap. Um, but we think we've got more flexibility and we don't think there are any other products going to be around that have the similar flexibility that anywhere near the price range that, that we're looking at. So we're hoping it's going to be within the price range of um, the hobbyist, the security researcher. I mean ideally someone will pick up one of these devices and be able to as a, as a student come up with, um, you know, explore the security of, of various protocols over ethernet or, or various other things and be able to explore the Mac layer. Um, and, and such. Um, and w I do, it'd be really nice if it was bus powered, but I think it's unlikely with the current power requirements. Um, but for some applications, that would be really nice. Uh, again, the HackRF project is bus powered. It's nice to be able to put something in your backpack, pull it out, and just start monitoring a communications channel, not have to worry about a huge rack mounted setup. And do you want me to wave this around? Or later. I, I just got it out. Had no idea it was this size. Um, so this is actually a, a Daisho mainboard um, uh, that is part built. Let's not look at the back. Um, and this is this is the sort of size we're looking to target in the future. Um, I have no idea where the main where the extension connector well, goes. I'll, I'll get that on you. We'll so talk about it later. Okay, that's fine. That will come later. Um, but it's going to be about that size, and then the front end modules will be a similar size and mount on top of them. Um, so you're looking at something you can easily carry around in your in your backpack and and take on customer sites or whatever you want to use it for. Um, so I was talking about the targets we're we're looking at. Um, and Mike said gigabit Ethernet or USB three. Um, we also want to look at HDMI because within the next couple of years, um, HDMI is going to have Ethernet 
over it. I mean, it already supports that. That's going to become far more popular. I think the next generation of games consoles are going to be using um, their, getting their internet connection over HDMI. Um, it's got all sorts of other interesting facets. You know, you can control devices over it as well using CEC. So we like that. And um, RS-232 because um, we wanted a nice, easy, straightforward It's all right. Um, we want a nice, easy, straightforward uh, technology that we could use the proof of concept. So one of the demos I'll be giving later is RS-232 tapping, um, and is probably the most overly engineered RS-232 tap you will ever see. <laughs> but but it was a nice proof of concept, so we could build something and say, yeah, we know this works before going on to build uh, complex front-end modules and things like that. Uh, and the uh, the idea, as I said previously, we add extra targets. Um, so if we suddenly decide we want to build something that looks at um, video, DVI video connections, then it's it's fairly straightforward to build a front end to that. And most of the the intelligence is going to be in the um, bitstream that gets put onto the FPGA on the main board, which we'll already have built and designed. So this is kind of the hard initial part, and then it should be fairly straightforward to add and expand it in the future. Uh, so it'll look something like this. The, the front end module will just have two connectors and, and will just sit in the middle of a, a connection. We don't have a front end board to wave around, do we? Yeah, it doesn't have any connectors on, but from this distance, it probably doesn't make much difference. Again, there'll be a picture in a minute. Um, but the idea is that, that there'll be a similar sort of size, have a couple of connectors on each side, and um, you'll, you'll put it in the middle of a connection, a target connection. And, and then it will tap the data. Um, we, we take the physical layer data back to the main board. And in the FPGA, we copy it into a buffer and then pass it back out of the other side of the connection and mirror it to the host. So it's, it's pretty straightforward in terms of the concept. Um, so I'd like to explain why we're doing this because that's the most common question we get. And this is, this is Wright's law uh, from Josh Wright. And we feel if we quote it often enough, it will become actually Wright's law. Um, if you Google it, you'll find a lawyer whose surname is Wright, who has a legal <laughs> company called Wright's Law. But, uh, and the idea being that until we can explore uh, the attack surface, until you can attack something at the physical layer or at any other, any other level, um, you can't be sure it's secure. You can look at a spec and say, yeah, I think it's probably pretty secure. Yeah, we, we avoided these traps and things like that. But until someone can go and probe it and say, well, is this implementation compliant? Does this really work? Then we're not going to know that a device or a protocol is, is secure. And, um, and I think most of, most of the work we do conforms to this. Um, and for example, Wi Fi connections uh, have, have often had monitor mode and promiscuous mode from, from the early days of of Wi-Fi cards. And that ability meant that we could go and explore the, the flaws in WEP and defeat it. And so the manufacturers were forced to, to start implementing WPA. And then the flaws in that were, have been shown. And we now have WPA2 in, in almost every device that you, would, you can buy on the market today. But as a counter example, the, uh, and I'm aware this is mostly my responsibility as a developer on Ubertooth, but uh, the, the Bluetooth pin, pin scheme is, is incredibly weak. It was shown to be vulnerable back in 2006, I believe. And they, they came out with a new version called Secure Simple Pairing. But I guarantee you can go out to any electronics store now and buy a headset that uses the old pin sharing method to, to connect devices because there's no, there's no excellent black hat talk that someone's come out and said, well, look, this is all vulnerable and, and here I can own a, a, a headset and a phone within minutes or something like that. And as soon as you can give that talk as soon as you can show that research has been done, then the device manufacturers will be forced by consumers to use the more secure methods. Um, so we, we think that's, that's kind of the important point here is that it, we're building tools to enable that research so that we can make things more secure in the future. I think I've mostly said what this slide says. Um, so the only thing to add is, is affordability. We, we know there are USB 3.0 network sniffers, we know there are gigabit ethernet network sniffers, but if it's going to cost you several thousand dollars and you need university or, or government funding in, in order to get one, then it's less likely that the right people are necessarily going to get it. We want this to be open to any researcher who has a good idea and the smart people don't always have the biggest funding. So we're hoping that it, it might be at least within range of someone who's, who's really smart about um, looking for flaws in these things. 
Uh, so everything's on GitHub. The tools, um, the reason it says where possible after tools here is that, that we um, can't use open source tools for FPGA development. We have to use the tools from the vendor. But what we have, um, we've chosen a part that is, um, is, can be used with the free tools. So the idea being that anyone who wants to get involved and, and join in with the project can at zero cost start building these, uh, these, these images for the FPGA. Uh, but unfortunately as yet there are no open source FPGA tools um, available. There are a couple of projects that have been started but they're, they're obviously fighting a very, very tough battle um, with, the, with the main vendors. Um, so for, for USB there's a fantastic device called the, the Beagle from Total Phase. Um, it's, it's an excellent piece of kit. It's uh, very, n we've been using it to debug our, our Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth, I don't know where I'm going with that, uh, debug our USB stack. But it, it's incredibly expensive and, and the same thing goes, it's not open source. You can't get in there and tinker with it. It's a completely closed box and, um, you know, fantastic if you can, if you can get hold of one and you want to debug your implementation. But we think other people might want to get in there and, uh, fuzz an implementation or play around with it and, and we'd like them to be able to um, build that with our tools. Um, and we'd like to, to as, as I say, encourage new researchers. Earlier today, uh, Andrea and Daniel um, gave their talk about uh, Ethernet packet injection. It was packets in packets on, on Ethernet. It was a fantastic talk. Try and see the video if you didn't get a chance. But in that they said they would like to migrate that that uh, attack to our die show platform at some point and I think they're, they're getting involved in the project and going to have a look at, at how they can use our method and our, our hardware to implement that attack and inject packets into an, an ethernet connection. That makes a lot of noise. Um, so is this still me? Yeah, you jump up. So we did a, uh, a two-part design, as we mentioned. So it's, uh, it's an FPGA main board connected by USB 3. Uh, so the FPGA can do uh, all the signal handling and some of the DSP and some of the other decoding uh, really quickly and then hand that up to the OS through an enormous bandwidth channel, pretty much the fastest you can get uh, other than Thunderbolt. And I don't think the Thunderbolt specs are really open for developing. Uh, so we have uh, multiple front ends on that that will develop for, uh, for different physical layers. So it's pretty much, uh, you know, the FPGA has uh, the RAM, it has an ARM processor for bootloading it uh, and USB to the host and then an arbitrary number of files depending on the uh, front board connected to that. So our development hardware is a uh, Trazic DE2-115 uh, which has a uh, Altera FPGA. Oh you're a brave man moving the demo. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's a fancy board, it's got lots of blinky lights on it, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's got a low speed uh, 2 by 20 header like a, a, a a uh, parallel port, not parallel port, uh, parallel uh, IDE, uh, and it's got a high speed mezzanine connector which we use for most of the things. Uh, it's well supported by a lot of development tools is why we picked it. Uh, it'll bootstrap the front end development until we have our own main board going. So, there we go. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive if you ever want to do FPGA development. This is I'll take on flat UI. But uh, the, the downsides of it is uh, the mezzanine connector can't handle high speed uh, comms that are high speed enough for what we need just because of the way their development board was designed. Uh, it's not particularly portable. It runs off a 12 volt power supply. Uh, it's a closed design. Uh, it's great but it's not what we wanted for the final development. So for the front end boards so far, we have a uh, hardware, uh, the RS-232 is our simplest front end board. It's just uh, a couple of 232 level shifters pretty much and uh, two, pair, two pairs of ports. Uh, it's extremely low speed compared to all the other boards but it's great for, uh, for testing. Uh, it's a two layer PCB. I think it's our only board that's only two layers. And I think the final version is four layers actually. So I'm already lying to you. So we, uh, we pretty much for this just convert 232 to uh, TTL. Uh, if anyone's familiar with RS-232 it's you know plus minus 12 volts and then yeah, for microcontroller level stuff you can just shift it down. Uh, we monitor all the signals so not just transmit and receive but all the, uh, the alternate handshake signals and whatnot we map through. Uh, we can jumper across certain connectors so if you don't want to deal with decoding you know DTS or whatever you can just jumper that across. Uh, right now we're using the 2x20 uh, connector or 2x40 connector on the DE2. Uh, in the final design we're using the mezzanine connector so it'll just socket together in a nice stack. So 
it's a pretty simple PCB layout for this one. Um, just two layers, you know, with the, the two uh, connectors. And there's one in reality. We have it sitting up here, but we probably shouldn't try to move it. Brah. Uh, so for Giggy, it was a much more complex board. So we have uh, two independent Giggy five layer chips uh, that'll do uh, 10, 100, and 1,000. So we dump the packets to the FPGA and then write them back out to the other side of the connector. Uh, so uh, we're using integrated jack magnetics. So you just solder down one connector and it's plug and go. Uh, it's more, connect, uh, more complicated. It's a four layer PCB, but it's still pretty reasonable to develop on, to uh, assemble on your own or get made through like Osh Park or something. So that's the. Uh, the PCP design on that one. We also do PoE pass through on it. And then we have the physical board made. And then so our goals for that are uh, uh, tapping one gig ethernet which can't be passively tapped since it randomly assigns uh, different directions to different pairs and whatnot so you can't just split it out like you can with 10 and 100. Uh, we're also going to do uh, very high precision time stamping of packets. So we'll be able to determine exactly, uh, you know, how long a round trip to the server at the other end took before it came back and replied. Uh, things like that. Uh, and we'll be able to do invisible monitoring since we're not at the Mac layer, we're not an Ethernet device as far as the Ethernet network is concerned. We're as, uh, we're as close as we can get to raw electrical monitoring. So uh, the, the, tr the phi transceiver chip will uh, transcode the bit stream. Uh, and does the electrical talking. Uh, the MAC layer is what gives you, you know, the MAC address, obviously, and uh, Ethernet frames and whatnot. So, all the sw all, as far as we know, all the existing hardware has a MAC layer. So, anything that does, you know, port mirroring and whatnot, it's a switch. It's it's got an Ethernet address. It's on the network in some some degree, so it's detectable. Uh, we don't have that, so we should be completely invisible. Uh, so we care about it because, yeah, as I mentioned, every with everyone already out there has the MAC layer on it. So bridging uh, obviously is very detectable since you're interfering with the spanning tree and whatnot. Um, and so we want to be as close to passive as we can possibly be. Uh, for the HDMI tap, we're looking at two HDMI ports uh, for in and out. Uh, so we're using a high speed SIRDES chip to, uh, to split the serialized HDMI stream into a large number of parallel bit streams so we can handle much, uh, uh, we can use a much lower power FPGA for it. Uh, so this is uh, one of the more complex boards. It's six layer design. It's very high speed. It's uh, difficult to hand assemble but it's still doable. So we're hoping to be able to get at least 1080p. Uh, we may even be able to get 4K. Uh, so it's currently straining the capability of the DE2 but uh, with uh, the final main board it'll be okay. Uh, so there's other ways to sniff HDMI. There's a bunch of boards out there that do it. Uh, the NETV does it, uh, for example, from Bunny, uh, but they can only do 720p or 1080i. Uh, you need a really, really fast FPGA to plumb the HDMI directly into you. Uh, since we're converting it into much slower parallel data, we can use, you know, cheaper components and a slower, uh, a slower FPGA. So that's the uh, HDMI board so far. It's uh, not quite finished. Uh, and HDMI is very interesting because as Mike mentioned it's, it's a complicated protocol. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going to be using it more in the future. There's uh, bi-directional communication on it. There's a 100 meg ethernet channel embedded in it. Uh, there's basically an I2C communication system between your devices and your TV for uh, transmitting resolutions and whatnot. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on in there so uh, we don't think there's anything else that exposes all of that so it'll be very interesting to see what there is. And then Jared can talk about the main board. So uh, I did the design on the main board which um, as has already been described is, is pretty much the data pump for the entire system. Um, the idea is for it to move data to and from whatever front end board you've attached uh, into and out of, uh, move the data into and out of, out of your host. So it's got an FPGA right in the center. Uh, it's an Altor Altera Cyclone 4, uh, EP4 CE30. Uh, it's a 780 pin BGA so it's got tons and tons and tons of pins. They're one millimeter spacing um, and somehow Mr. Osman soldered it. <laughs> uh, we've also got a uh, USB 3.0 um, super speed uh, phi attached to the FPGA and um, that's how we get all the data into and out of the host. We've got a DDR2 slot which is um, I think it's it will function up to four gigabytes worth of, of RAM and a uh, NXP microcontroller which kind of orchestrates bringing up the entire board. Uh, there's about I think four or five different voltages that need to be on, on the board in order to power all the different components. So it's important to se sequence those as, as the board is powered up 
uh, and make sure that they're they're done in the correct order. Uh, there's also an SD card slot, uh, micro SD, which is where we would store the bitstream to load into the FPGA to give it whatever characteristics it needs to perform whatever um, attacks you're 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 targeting. Um, let's see, what else have we got in here? I think that's about it. Uh, front end connector is actually on the back. It, it turned out to be pretty much the easiest way to get everything on such a small board. So this is uh, kind of an x-ray view of the, uh, the, the design of the board. It was done using uh, eight layers and uh, software called KiCad which uh, or some people pronounce it KiCad. Uh, you can see pretty much all of the signals are emanating from the FPGA because it's effectively the nexus for every all the data that transfers through the system. Uh, and then there's a very strong flow from the USB chip on the left into the FPGA in the middle. Uh, this is a picture of the, the board before it was assembled completely. It looks like there's a few components on the board, yeah. Uh, a very good way to when you're built bringing up a, a new piece of hardware is to build it incrementally so you don't wind up blowing up your $50 FPGA uh, because it turns out you screwed up something very simple up in the power su subsystem. Uh, and there it is fully assembled. Um, not much to say about that actually. So uh, Dragon will tell you more about the uh, CAD tools that we used since he uh, he's as familiar as I am with the pain involved. So there's a, a ton of CAD tools out there to pick from. Uh, there's the commercial stuff like Altium and whatnot. There's uh, Eagle which is sort of free but not really. And then there's a couple of pure GPL tools. Uh, we went with uh, KeyCAD. Uh, it's fully GPL. It's, uh, there's no weird licensing. There's no size limits on it. So it seemed a good choice at the time. This, this kind of says it all. <laughs> uh, so KeyCAD is really good in a lot of ways. Uh, it's capable of, you know, N layer boards. So Eagle, uh, if you want to do more than two layers, you're paying a lot of licensing fees, uh, things like that. So uh, KeyCAD, you can do any number of layers. I think pretty much as much as, as much RAM as you have, it can do that many layers. Uh, there's no size restrictions. You can make your PCB as big as you need. Uh, the file format is friendly-ish. Uh, it's all text so it can cooperates very well with uh, Git and uh, Subversion and whatnot. Uh, you can edit them, sometimes you have to. Uh, it's truly open source so you get all the benefits of the fine open source GUI. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, on the other hand you can fix bugs in it and whatnot so it's, it's, it's handy. You never truly get backed into a corner if you're willing to put in the time it has to mean you're willing to put in the time. Uh, unfortunately sometimes KeyCAD does some <laughs> odd things. Um, I'm not sure what it did. <laughs> <They're kind of laughs> it, it, yeah I might frame that one. Um, you can kind of see uh, to the side a little bit of the rest of the circuit and then it just decided one of those pads needed to be really big. <laughs> Uh, so, so there's some, some, some significant challenges with KeyCAD. Uh, right now they haven't had a stable release in a little over a year. Uh, the development version changed the file format so you can go from stable development but you can't go back. So right now some of our uh, boards are in the new version and some of them are in the old version. Um, it's not very good at moving components once they're placed so expect some pain when you're doing layout. And uh, there's no helpful tools for doing things like length matching, uh, high speed parallel lines. Uh, there's nothing that helps you route out of the BGA and whatnot. Uh, so I kind of feel like for some of the complex designs we're doing, it feels a bit right only where you can make the board, but if you have to go back and edit it, you're going to be a very sad person. Uh, which really makes uh, Jared's work on the main board incredibly impressive. So uh, some of those challenges we had in designing the boards, uh, high speed digital signals behave very oddly sometimes. Um, we, they act a bit more like analog and RF at that point. Uh, the fab requirements become a fundamental part of your design. Uh, Jared had to go back and redesign some of the main board uh, trace widths specifically for the fab house we use to make them. So you, you need to really talk, you need to be able to talk to whoever you have uh, manufacturing your circuit boards once you get up to the high speed multi layer stuff. Um, for these boards, home assembly is still possible as, as Mike Osman proved. Uh, it's kind of ridiculous that he managed to do that I think. Uh, you probably wouldn't want to unless you're really dedicated. Uh, and unfortunately once you get above more than four layers on a circuit board, prototype sized runs are incredibly expensive. They can still be done but you're talking a couple thousand dollars, five thousand dollars for a dozen boards. 
Uh, so for our requirements, many of the designs with the BGA, you know, uh, need more than four layer, which puts us outside of most of the prototype fab. So we couldn't use Oshpark, we couldn't use Batch PCB or anyone like that. Um, we also had to do what's called via and pad, where the some of the holes through the circuit board go through the pads that uh, that the components are on, which is, I believe you said it almost doubles the cost. Something like that. Yeah, yeah it's something like doubles the cost of making the boards at prototype size. Uh, so we had and we had to work with the fab on the layer stack up. You know uh, what what layers went where, how thick each layer was, uh, because it affects the impedance and whatnot. So high speed signals would get corrupted if we didn't organize that. So if you're doing if you're doing high speed board design on your own, you need to you need to pick a fab that'll actually talk to you with a, about their about their exact specs. And then so uh, for our main board, uh, it's eight copper layers, uh, and then uh, well these are just they're interesting numbers. Other than that, it's boring. <laughs> and then uh, the main board firm firmware uh, is mostly being developed by uh, Marshall, who couldn't be here. But uh, we believe it's the world's for first open source USB 3 core. So all the USB 3 handling is done on the FPGA, and that's all in the in the Git repository. Uh, and it's uh, the minimal implementation of what we need to shove the raw data up to the host. Uh, so right now we don't need independent bit streams for each FPGA or each front end, but there is a small I square C in the design on each front end board. So when you plug it in, the uh, the processor on the main board will automatically detect what's been plugged into it and then load the appropriate code from the from the SD card. So if there's a front end that needs all the space in the FPGA, it can have its own file and it'll get automatically programmed when you uh, boot. And then on the software side, uh, there's libdisho, which Dominic is writing, which is a user space driver based on libusb, so it should be compatible across other platforms as well, like Windows and, uh, and OS X. And then for Wireshark integration, we're using a, uh, a system Mike Ryan and I developed called uh, XCap, which we're hoping to merge into the Wireshark main code very soon, which allows external capture programs to to appear as if they were network devices to Wireshark and allow you to directly directly capture from them inside the GUI, and that'll be part of our demo. So uh, yeah, we uh, we're, the the XCap stuff is still under development. Uh, basically, it just allows an external tool to develop to uh, export a simple GUI, and then Wireshark rolls that into the GTK GUI, so it all looks it all looks uh, integrated and pretty. So, you know, just a couple quick examples of that. You know, your standard Wireshark capture config window, and then there's just some random tools from a previous demo. So uh, on the software side, the USB 3 enumeration, we can complete, completely control that. So we can, uh, we could even uh, present an Ethernet device to the host for capturing Ethernet, um, or we could present the con uh, the consistent uh, raw data uh, below Ethernet layer and then translate it on the host if we wanted. Uh, it is possible for front end boards to, uh, you know, we could present to CDC ACMs or whatever. Um, so we have several options on that, depending on if you want to present uh, sniffed Ethernet data or if you want to present high timestamp precision raw file layer data. And now the scary part. <laughs> Wish us luck. Thank you. Yeah. I wasn't nervous until this moment. <laughs> All right. There are two demos. Uh, one is going to be RS232, uh, which I expect you all to be incredibly thrilled about. Uh, what we're going to do here is we've got a front end module that's got two um, USB to RS232. Oh, really? Picking up the, the oh. demo board. Um, so it's got these USB to RS232 adapters, um, standard thing you buy for 10 bucks. And they plug into our front end. Data goes through the um, the FPGA on the the D2, and then back out of the other one, and then we tap it to the host using our own um, our own USB stack that uh, Marshall's written, and we use libdisho. Now this one does not have the world's prettiest GUI, so let me see what I can. So just to just to prove that we've got two two serial serial connections connected to each other back to back, if I type in one down here, it appears in the other one, and if I go up to here. It appears in the first. And uh, now, let me. Oh. So I should be able to just run. Dot slash. Show RS232, and this will dump some information. So what we're seeing here, as I type in one of these windows, is you'll see the characters uh, obviously not translated through. Um, but what what you're seeing is the uh, the data is going over RS232. We're then copying the signals on all of the lines on that connection and dumping them all with a timestamp every time there's a change. So essentially, what we get there is is a, a 
a sort of logic analyzer for for um, the RS232 port, and that will show us. Um, we can then interpret that data into ASCII or whatever other data it might we might have going over that connection. There's no limitation on it being a specific format or, or anything like that. It can be whatever's going over that wire. It could be a completely custom protocol that just happens to be using the same uh, connectors and voltage levels uh, to, to move stuff around. And then we can just interpret that from the timestamps and transform that into um, a binary waveform to show us the data shifting around. Um, I went to the bar last night rather than writing the, the waveform viewer for that. So unfortunately, this is this is as good as the RS232 demo gets, which is. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sorry. This this byte just here, you'll notice you'll notice that this switches between ones and zeros, and that is that is our bit. That's our transmit bit as we go through in one direction. And if I move data in the opposite direction, oh, wrong one. Why? Oh yeah, oh, that was the right one. Uh, you'll notice that this bit here is changing instead, and that's the transmit line in the opposite direction. And so, as long as you monitor those two, you can then take the the timing gaps to work out um, your bit time and things like that. And we we you can write code here to attempt to automatically determine board rate. Um, although, if you know the board rate, then it's really easy to write code to convert this to to printable data. Um, so that's the RS232 demo. I know, rocking. Uh, Ethernet. So this is the one we finished writing about two hours ago, um, and I'm slightly more confident in this. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, so if we can switch the serial connector over. Let's turn it off before we. Um, we've only got one pair, one serial device. So I'll, I'll explain what we're doing here. Um, we we have two Beagle bones. Um, from TI, lovely little open source boards, um, and we're using them to just just they ping each other, and they're connected to the gigabit Ethernet board uh, front end that's also connected to the D2, and then we're backhauling the data. Now, our USB connector for the um, D2 uses the same uh, onboard connection as the um, as the gigabit Ethernet front end module, so we can't have them both plugged in at the same time. So we're actually doing data backhaul to to the host. Uh, using RS232 uh, because we had an RS232 board and it seemed like we may as well use that to send the data back. So what we actually do is, is take it, take the data in um, a half byte at a time and convert that to to a, a hex representation in ASCII. Then we send that over RS232. The host then converts it back to binary, reassembles the bytes in the right order, and then dumps that into a PCAP, which hopefully. Using the the ex external capture stuff that um, Mike Kershaw and, and Mike Ryan wrote for uh, for Wireshark should mean that we can monitor this connection with Wireshark. Yeah. Just understanding what the demo was going to do took half the time. <laughs> okay, right, Wireshark. So, oh, it's shown up on the wrong screen. Uh. Okay, um, that's not. Yeah, that's, that's very vaguely readable. So we're we're using two. Oh, not that one. These two devices to capture, and if everyone could cross their fingers, that doesn't look. That doesn't look like it worked. Oh. <laughs> okay, so so this demo didn't work, and it was the one I was more confident in, and I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's a bit of a failure. Uh, well, you can see. So here you can see these these being dumped over over serial. So these are the packets as they come through. The 555 at the beginning is the preamble that you wouldn't normally see if you dump these things with um, TCP dump or something like that, because that gets stripped off by the Mac layer in your card. So we are getting more data than you would get with a standard uh, network tapping methodology. Um, and you can see those data, that that data coming through. I'm almost certain that the problem. I think the problem is probably that I'm also showing them in a serial console. You know. Yeah, that'll totally work. <laughs> that'll totally not work. Okay, let's try. let's try it again. Okay, let me say I'm just going to kill Wireshark. There you go. Cannot open serial device. I should have looked at the error messages. <laughs> wow. 
Who knew printf was so useful? <laughs> All right. There we go. Yay. So, so no. I was about to address exactly oh. that problem. So what you what you can see here is um, I've, I've chopped off the preamble in my code, um, which is something I don't really want to do, um, to fit it into the uh, link type for uh, Ethernet that the Wireshark use stand used by default or libpcap uses. Um, we have to go to the TCP dump mailing list and run that gauntlet in order to to get a second link type that is physical layer Ethernet because no one's requested one yet which makes me believe we're the first people to, to build a tap like this that integrates with these, uh, these tools because otherwise they would have requested it before. But it's feasible that in the future we'll have um, things that are dumped into Wireshark including the preamble and any extra interesting data or noise that we see around it um, which will help debug uh, connections at an even lower layer than is currently possible. So on that note we should probably go back. Hmm. Oh, I have no idea where the slides are. There we go. All right. Um, so, over the next couple of months, we need to finish building the main boards. We've only got one and a half built so far, so we need to build some others. There are a couple of corrections that we need to make to the to the designs. Um, we need to build uh, the HDMI front end, and then we need to take our current front ends for the um, gigabit Ethernet and HDMI and retarget them once we've worked out some of the development kinks. To, to use our main board rather than the, the DE2 development board. Um, we're then going to look at a, a USB 3 front end board which we weren't able to use with the DE2 because as, as, as Dragon said there's, there's not enough uh, space on the connector for us to get all the signals through. Um, and we're going to do things like uh, identify the front end when you plug it in so that we can load the appropriate bit stream from the SD card and things like that so you won't have to have a host controlling this stuff. You'll be able to um, take the, the board and the front end and just have the, an SD card with all your different bit streams on and switch over the front end boards and it will just handle it automatically as it powers up. Um, as I said earlier, the idea of it being um, extensible is that we can add, add a, additional targets with very low effort. So um, we can look at things like DisplayPort and DVI and um, and, and other protocols that you use. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the telephone DSL idea, just going up to a, the outside of a, someone's house and clipping on a couple of alligator clips to their, uh, to their phone line and just pulling in everything. Um, and I imagine you want to talk about SDR. I'll let you go for it. Yeah, I really like that idea of tapping phone lines and getting like audio and DSL at the same time. Uh, that's really cool. Um, and one of the possible applications that Several of us up here, we're all interested in uh, down the road is is doing more uh, high speed wide band uh, software defined radio applications. Um, the the HackRF project that I'm launching right now is uh, uh, pretty wide band compared to a lot of the SDR solutions out there. It's uh, 20 megahertz of bandwidth. So if you imagine like your your FM radio stations are only 200 kilohertz apart. So 20 megahertz of bandwidth is 100 times wider than that and it's enough to capture something like an 802.11G packet. Uh, but it's not enough to capture um, like uh, an 802.11N 40 megahertz wide channel. Uh, or the new 802.11 AC standard that's coming out that can have up to 160 megahertz wide channels. Some of this stuff that's coming out now is is uh, the, the higher speed communication systems are, are super wide bandwidth and there's really no way that we can do software defined radio with a general purpose computer unless we take advantage of things like the FPGA and the USB 3.0 connection that we have available to us on the die show. Um, so like one thing I really want to do is monitoring the entire 2.4 gigahertz ISM band so that we can decode all Bluetooth packets from all near buy Bluetooth devices all at once uh, instead of trying to hop along with them which is what we try to do with the Ubertooth project with mixed success. Um, so uh, and, and then down the road I, I'd like to see 
Uh, I, I, some of us up here have some other plans for this platform that we want to use it for totally unrelated things. If you have, if you're an electronics designer and you have any interest in a platform that gives you USB 3.0 connect, connectivity with uh, FPGA, then the Dyshow platform might be right for you know, all, a whole variety of projects. Anything where you want to get data in and out of a USB attached system at the absolute highest rate possible. I mean, USB 3.0 is about 10 times faster than USB 2.0. So it's really an exciting thing to, to be producing this open source platform for USB 3.0, um, even though it's a big, complicated project. Um, it's really big for us, and we wouldn't be able to take this on and have this cast of thousands working on this project and be building eight layer circuit boards uh, without financial support. So uh, our big thanks to the DARPA Cyber Fast Track program and Bit Systems. Um, these guys have been terrific. Um, we really thank Mudge for, for kicking off that whole, pro that whole project. And um, uh, I don't know, I don't have a whole lot to say about that other than they're awesome, thank you. Um, and I think we have a little bit of time for questions, maybe five minutes. Um, any questions out there? Shoot. Yes, good question. Face Dancer by Travis Goodspeed. The Face Dancer board has, uh, does implement some of the things that I wanted to do with my original concept for a USB man in the middle or a USB multi tool board. Um, the Face Dancer board uh, allows you to like connect um, as a device to your host computer where you're controlling it from and then also connect as a device to a target computer uh, that you can attack or emulate a device connected to. So some of the stuff that I'm interested in doing um, has been implemented using the face dancer. There are also some folks who have implemented similar things using the Linux uh, USB gadget stack uh, with Android devices in particular um, and some other platforms as well. Uh, Dominic's been working on something with the, with the BeagleBone Black actually that uh, uh, he uh, will probably be talking about at a future event. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so, so yeah, uh, the face dancer is really cool. I definitely recommend checking that out and it's a lower cost way to do some of the stuff that we're doing but not all of the stuff that we're doing. Uh, the, you know, our focus for this project is primarily on getting to the physical layer. You know, we've had tools for years that give us high layer uh, monitoring. Like you can run uh, Wireshark on your host computer and capture something from your, your, your Ethernet port or your USB port, but it's only what the host OS sees. And then you can use a, a network tap of some kind that gives you a little lower level access, but typically that's only Mac layer access and not physical layer access. And if we can, if we get one layer, we basically get all the layers above it. So why not target the very bottom most layer we possibly can and that's the physical layer and that's what we're trying to get to with this project and make that technique available to as many different target media as possible. Uh, any other questions? One on the right. Right. Uh, good question. How is how is um, what we're doing different from using uh, uh, like a high speed digital oscilloscope and um, pulling bits off of it, pulling a waveform off of it, and then analyzing that in software? Uh, to some extent, some of the things that we're doing are very similar to that approach, um, but generally for the for the high speed communication systems that we're targeting like USB 3.0 and HDMI um, we're, we're dealing with systems that are multiple gigabits per second on a, on a wire 
And in order to do that kind of approach with a digital oscilloscope requires a big expensive oscilloscope. Um, we're trying to make a platform, it's a little more, it's a little higher, it's going to end up being a little higher cost than most of the stuff that we work on. Um, but we're looking at thing at like the few hundred dollar range instead of the few tens of thousands of dollar range. So we're trying to make something smaller, more portable and lower cost um, and we're, we're able to make it we're able to achieve those goals primarily by using the off the shelf Phi chips for particular target technologies that we put on the front end board instead of having a general purpose high speed sampler uh, in the form of a, like an oscilloscope. Uh, one more. That's a that's a good question too. Uh, do uh, do we envision a uh, a renaissance in fuzzing for for attacking hardware layer? Um, I definitely I definitely think uh, we we have that in mind. That we we hope to enable much more uh, research and development in ter in uh, investigation of the security of of protocols from the lowest possible layer, layers that have been ignored before. Uh, and like Dominic mentioned earlier, Andrea and Daniela's talk from this morning was a fantastic example of that where they implemented an attack on uh, wired ethernet um, and they were doing 100 base T where, where 100 base TX where we're targeting to support of gigabit as well uh, with Daisho. But they found an attack that they could execute against, uh, and multiple attacks actually, against uh, wired ethernet that nobody found before. And the reason they found it is because they were exploring the physical layer where in the past people have only explored down to the Mac layer. So we're hoping to enable that for all target media that we possibly can. Uh, and we think that, that there will be tremendous opportunities for fuzzing and other types of exploration uh, of those attack surfaces. Uh, thanks a lot everybody.